Caffeine is one of the most widely used and abused drugs in the world. And most people think since caffeine is a stimulant, that it is therefore a solution to a lot of their sleep problems and to them feeling chronically tired. But what if I told you that your need for caffeine is a sign that you are not sleeping well and you are in a state of chronic sleep deprivation? If you cannot function normally without caffeine, then you are probably in a state of chronic sleep deprivation. And unfortunately, most people are. Two thirds of Americans are not getting the recommended amount of sleep every night. Most people take getting enough sleep and getting sleep quality very lightly. They usually don't take it that seriously. And unfortunately, they have to start self-medicating themselves with things like coffee or caffeine just to function throughout the day. But there is an alarming amount of evidence of what can happen to your body when you do not sleep enough and when you're not getting sleep quality. And this is the problem with caffeine because caffeine is actively harming your sleep. So I'm gonna get into all this more in detail, so make sure you stick around for the full video. Every day, about 90% of Americans are consuming caffeine, and most of them are consuming more than 300 milligrams of caffeine in a day. In other words, a lot of people cannot go a single day without getting that caffeine, and it has become a major staple in the standard American diet and a lot of other diets around the world. One of the major things I wanna talk about is drinking coffee or other types of caffeine is not a solution to not getting enough sleep, especially when you consume it at high doses or at the wrong time. So let's just start off from the beginning. What is the reason that most people need to consume caffeine? One of the biggest reasons people need to consume caffeine is because they're not giving themselves enough sleep opportunity time. Now that is time actively spent trying to sleep in bed. So let's say someone is sleeping eight hours a night. Now when someone says they sleep eight hours, what does that actually mean? Well, usually people will say that I spent eight hours of time in bed sleeping. Well, you're not gonna be asleep 100% of the time. So you're probably gonna get a little bit under eight hours of sleep when you say you spent eight hours in bed. So if you wanna ensure that you're getting eight hours of sleep a night, you need to get at least eight hours in the bed. And really you should be talking about getting eight to nine hours in bed. But unfortunately, a lot of people give themselves a much lower amount of sleep opportunity time. Most people give themselves about five to six and a half hours of their sleep opportunity. And that'll only equate to about four and a half to six hours of sleep for most people. So one example I wanna show what can really happen with even just a minimal amount of sleep deprivation is daylight savings time. So a lot of people in the Northern Hemisphere, around March time, they have to do something called daylight savings time where they move their clocks forward an hour, so essentially they're losing an hour of sleep. Just losing that one hour of sleep opportunity does a lot of harm and a lot of people don't realize this. For example, researchers looked at millions of hospital records and they found that just that one day of losing one hour of sleep came with a significant increase in the amount of heart attacks the next day. And there was also an increase in traffic accidents. So a study was looking at 732,000 accidents over the course of two decades. And they found that the day after daylight savings time, there was a significant increase in the amount of traffic accidents. And there was also a 6% increase in the amount of fatal accidents the following week. So you can make a pretty accurate prediction that if there's daylight savings time, there's gonna be more fatalities on the road the following week. At the same time, when people start moving their clocks backwards in November and people start gaining an hour of sleep, we see the exact opposite. We see medical records start to plummet. We see traffic accidents start to plummet. So just gaining that one hour of sleep does a lot of benefit as well. So most people think that if you just lose one hour of sleep on a random night, it's not that big of a deal because you can make it up later. But when you look at the data, you can really see that it is a big issue. Now going back to caffeine, people who regularly consume coffee or other types of caffeine are gonna have a harder time falling asleep at night. And drinking caffeine can actually mimic symptoms of insomnia. Now the thing is someone who has chronic insomnia can actually use caffeine to help cope with their symptoms of insomnia and their symptoms of sleep deprivation. But the problem is that drinking this caffeine will actually make your insomnia worse because it can actively block your sleep. So in a nutshell, there's basically two things that are controlling your sleep. The first one is your circadian rhythm. and The second one is your body's sleep pressure. And that is done by a molecule called adenosine. So going into your circadian rhythm first, this is controlled by a hormone called melatonin 
We've all heard of those melatonin pills that people take to help them go to sleep. And the reason why is your melatonin will build up throughout the day. And in the evening time, and specifically when it's more dark outside, that is when your melatonin peaks. And this is basically telling a signal to your body that it's time to go to sleep. So when your melatonin peaks, that's gonna be one of the main triggers that help you go to sleep at night. Now, the second thing that controls your sleep is a molecule called adenosine. Now, your adenosine is entirely independent to your circadian rhythm. Your melatonin and your adenosine, while they work at the same time, they're completely independent of one another. So your adenosine depends on how long you've been awake. The longer you've been awake, the more of this adenosine molecule that builds up in your brain. And the more adenosine you have, the more sleep pressure you have. So more adenosine means you're gonna be more sleepy. Your adenosine will build up throughout the day and it, again, it'll peak at nighttime. So at nighttime, for a typical person, their melatonin will peak and their adenosine will peak and this is what's gonna ensure that they get good sound sleep throughout the night. Now this is exactly where caffeine will start to intervene. Your caffeine will start to affect this adenosine because your caffeine will block these adenosine receptors. So you have all this adenosine that's building up in your brain and it wants to attach to these receptors in your brain to tell you that you're sleepy, but now you have this caffeine that's blocking those receptors so that this adenosine can never interact with it. So your brain doesn't feel that sleepiness. So your caffeine is more of a sleep blocker. It blocks these adenosine molecules and it prevents you from feeling more tired. But the problem is that caffeine will eventually go away. And I'm gonna talk more about how long that actually takes for that caffeine to go away in just a little bit. But once that caffeine all goes away, that buildup from that adenosine molecule will be really intense because that whole time while that caffeine has been blocking those adenosine receptors, that adenosine molecule has been building up more and more. So that once that caffeine all goes away, you get this huge influx of these adenosine molecules and that will all hit you at once. And this is why people get that caffeine crash once all that caffeine wears off. So at this point, people have two options. They either deal with it and they fight through that sleepiness or they will drink more caffeine to help mitigate this. Now, the thing with caffeine is that it has an extremely high half-life. Now, a half-life is basically what a lot of doctors and pharmacists assign to a drug. And that is basically a time frame of how long it takes for that drug to clear away. So a half-life is how long it takes for half of that drug to dissipate or get out of your system. And for caffeine, that half-life is about six hours. So that means that after drinking a cup of coffee, half of that caffeine is still gonna be in your system. So that means if you drink a cup of coffee at noon, then that's equivalent to drinking half a cup of coffee at 6 p.m. And that also means that a quarter of that cup of coffee is gonna be there at midnight. So drinking a cup of coffee at noon is the equivalent of drinking a quarter cup of coffee at midnight. Now let's go back a little bit. Let's say someone drinks coffee in the morning and then later on in the evening they get that caffeine crash and they wanna try to fight through that a little bit so they have that evening cup of coffee. This is where it can start to do some real damage because if you have a cup of coffee at 6 p.m., now half of that caffeine is still gonna be in your system at midnight when we're trying to sleep. And this is how it can mimic those symptoms of insomnia because even though we have all this adenosine that's building up because we've been awake all day, it's not getting attached to our brain and it's not giving us that sleep signal for us to go to sleep. And that means that all night long, your brain has to fight this force of this caffeine so that it can adequately provide you enough sleep. And you might be one of those people that think that, oh, if I have an evening cup of coffee, I can still go to sleep at night, it's not a problem. Well, sometimes you don't even realize it is a problem because it's not just the amount of sleep that you're getting that gets affected. It also affects your sleep quality. And most people, when they have a bad night of sleep and they don't feel well rested, they don't attribute it to the caffeine that they had the night before. Either they think it's normal for them to wake up with brain fog and for them to not feel fully well rested, or they attribute it to something else. And then what happens is the next day they're gonna be more reliant on this coffee and they wanna drink this caffeine again so that they can improve their brain concentration and get rid of that brain fog so that they can focus again. But you can see the problem is that it's a never ending cycle where the caffeine is causing those sleep issues 
and then they wake up and they need it again and again. And it's not just in coffee. There's caffeine in different ice creams and teas and chocolate and Coke and some other sodas. So caffeine is all around us and sometimes it can be really hard to avoid. But caffeine consumption is one of the biggest reasons that people do not get enough sleep and that they do not get enough sleep quality. And again, many people mistake this as insomnia and they start to self-diagnose themselves and say, oh, I have insomnia. And again, what do they do? They say, I need this coffee the next morning because I have insomnia and I can't sleep at night. Now, the thing with insomnia is there's a very specific criteria for someone to be diagnosed with insomnia. And surprisingly, even with this very strict definition of insomnia, a lot of people still have insomnia. If you think back to last night or even last week and say, I didn't really sleep well this last week or even last night. Well, that's not enough for it to be called insomnia. Insomnia requires week to week and month to month struggling with this condition and not being able to fall asleep. And there are some very specific things that have to be checked off for someone to be diagnosed with insomnia. Now, the first one, a lot of people could qualify for. It's not being happy with your sleep quality or your quantity. So essentially, you're not happy with how much sleep you're getting even though you're trying to go to sleep. You're not waking up refreshed the next morning. Now, the second criteria is you suffer distress or daytime impairment during the day. Now, again, this is why a lot of people who have insomnia, that they rely on that caffeine because they suffer that impairment throughout the day. Now, the third criteria is this insomnia has to last at least three nights a week for the course of at least three months. Now, that's a pretty long span of time. That's why I was saying that if it was just one week of not sleeping well, it doesn't necessarily mean you have insomnia. It could be a lot of other things that are going on. You could be stressed out with work or something else, etc. It could be a change in your lifestyle, your diet, a lot of other things can also play into your sleep. And the last criteria for insomnia is you basically have to rule out any other condition. It cannot be attributable to any other disorder. Now, surprisingly, with all that specific criteria, still about one in nine people will have chronic insomnia. Now, here's where I have a problem with this. All of these symptoms and this specific criteria can be explained by how people consume their caffeine. If you consume too much caffeine, or you consume it at the wrong time in the day, then it can masquerade all of these insomnia symptoms. So if you're watching this and thinking that, I swear, I drink a ton of caffeine and I sleep great, I do not have any of these problems, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, there's a chance that you could be a fast metabolizer of your caffeine. So your caffeine is removed from your system by enzymes in your liver. They're called the cytochrome P450 enzymes. I'm not gonna get into specifics on the specific types of different enzymes, just know that there are different types and some of these enzymes are very fast metabolizing, but the majority of them are very slow metabolizing. And what studies are showing is that your genetics will actually play a role in whether you are a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer of this caffeine. Before you jump to the conclusion and say, oh, I gotta be one of those fast metabolizers, thanks, you finally explained it. Well, majority of people will have the half-life of six hours, and they'll be the slow metabolizers of caffeine. And right now, it's actually very rare for people to have that genetic mutation where they digest caffeine very fast. So how would you know? Well, you'd have to take a genetic test just to make sure and see which one of those cytochrome P450 enzymes that you have. But if you are one of those fast metabolizers of caffeine, then you could probably have a double espresso with your dinner and be just fine and sleep just fine. So it's not for everyone, but the majority of people will suffer when they drink caffeine in the evening or when they drink too much caffeine. So if you are a slow metabolizer of caffeine, like most people are, you should probably stop drinking caffeine before noon. That way it gives your body to clear that all out of your system so that you can get enough sleep at night and that you can actually fall asleep without having those symptoms of insomnia. Now, the other thing with caffeine is the older that we get, the harder it is for our body to remove it from our system. So in other words, we get more sensitive to caffeine the older that we are. So for older people, drinking caffeine will put a harder time on their body when they're trying to sleep. Now this is really important because elderly people have a lot harder time staying and falling asleep at night. And one of the reasons is because their adenosine doesn't 
build up as much and as intensely as a younger person's would. So drinking this caffeine and blocking this adenosine is going to do a lot more harm to an elderly person compared to a younger person. You might think that this adenosine or the sleep pressure is not a big deal and that you can fall and stay asleep just fine without it, but it really is a big deal. And if you've ever struggled falling asleep or if you ever felt like you had insomnia, you can understand why this adenosine or the sleep pressure is super important. Now, I know I mentioned that you get less quality sleep even if you do fall asleep with caffeine, so I'm gonna get more into that now. Specifically, when you drink caffeine, you get less of your deep NREM sleep. So when we go to sleep, we have these different sleep stages. So our sleep starts off as something called non-REM or NREM, and we have four different stages of your NREM, and they get progressively deeper the later in the stages that you go. So someone in stage one NREM sleep will be a lot easier to wake up than someone in stage four non-REM sleep. And then you have something called REM sleep. I'm not gonna get too much into that because caffeine affects your NREM sleep more than your REM sleep. But your REM sleep is basically where most of your dreaming occurs. And the reason it's called REM sleep is it stands for rapid eye movement. So your eyes will dart back and forth and as if you're watching a movie or a TV show or something like that. But this is where a lot of your dreaming occurs and there's a lot of other benefits to REM sleep as well. And I did talk about that a little bit in a different podcast, so we'll put a link to that in the description below. But your NREM sleep is your deep sleep that occurs before this REM sleep part. So people who have more caffeine, there's studies showing that they get less of this deep part of their NREM sleep. So their later stages of their NREM sleep, that's stages three and four, of their non-REM sleep. Now getting enough of this NREM sleep is super important because this is where a lot of your recovery happens when you're sleeping and it's really important for your memories. So one thing that your NREM sleep does is something called synaptic pruning. So basically what that is, is it's taking all these incoming memories and things that you learn throughout the day and it's filtering them. So it's basically weeding out all the non-important things and keeping all the important things that you would focus on throughout the day. And there's a ton of studies that have been done throughout the years, and they all show that when people do not get as much of this NREM sleep, that their memory is worsened, and they do not remember things as much as someone who would get more of this NREM sleep. And one other important thing to remember with your NREM and your REM sleep is, they occur in different proportions throughout the night. So earlier in the night, you're gonna have more of your NREM sleep. And later on in the night, in the second half of the night, you're going to have more of this REM sleep. So someone who goes to sleep at a normal time, but they wake up two hours early, let's say, and they only get six hours of sleep, they're going to be cutting out a lot of that REM sleep. At the same time, if someone wakes up at a normal time, but they go to sleep two hours later, then they're going to be cutting out a lot of that NREM sleep. So it's not going to be proportional with how much sleep you cut off. Now, going back to caffeine, another problem that caffeine causes is that it increases your sympathetic nervous system activity. Anytime you wanna talk about sleep, you wanna avoid anything that's gonna cause more anxiety or increase your stress levels. But unfortunately, that's exactly what caffeine does. One of the most common culprits to people not being able to sleep well is they have an overactive sympathetic nervous system or they're in a constant state of this fight or flight. So your sympathetic nervous system is part of your body's autonomic nervous system. So you have what's called your parasympathetic nervous system and also your sympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic nervous system is basically your body's rest and relax mode. So anytime that you're resting on the couch or when you're trying to go to sleep, that's when your parasympathetic nervous system is activated. At other times, your sympathetic nervous system, or again, it's called your fight or flight, is activated. Your sympathetic nervous system is meant to be very short-lived and Throughout history, this is exactly what it was intended for, and that's why it's called your fight or flight response. When your sympathetic nervous system gets activated, all these changes will occur in your body. Your blood pressure will increase, your heart rate will increase, your muscles will get activated, and all these changes are occurring so that you can survive. So your sympathetic nervous system is for a state of survival. Now, the thing is that if you are stressed or anxious about something, then your sympathetic nervous system will still be activated. So all these different biomarkers in your health, your blood pressure, your heart rate, et cetera, all these things will still go up when you are chronically stressed, even though you're not trying to fight off a bear or escape or trying to survive from some attacker. Now, the thing is that caffeine also does this. So there was a study from the American Heart Association, and they were looking at 15 healthy volunteers. Some of these people were regular coffee drinkers, and some of these people 
never really drank coffee that much. So they were measuring different parts of their body. So they were measuring their blood pressure, their heart rate, and also the activity of their sympathetic nervous system. And they were basically comparing these different biomarkers when they drank different types of caffeine. So they either drank an espresso, or they drank a decaffeinated espresso, or they just got an IV infused amount of caffeine. So there was, wasn't really coffee, it was just the caffeine part that was isolated. And the last group was a placebo. So the same group was used in all four conditions and they wanted to see how it affected people who were either used to drinking caffeine or people who were not used to drinking caffeine. And what they found is whether you were drinking coffee or had the caffeine IV infused into you, that either way it increased your sympathetic nervous system activity, and it also increased your blood pressure. And that part's pretty obvious, but what about people who regularly consume coffee? Well, even in this group, they still had an increase in their sympathetic nervous system activity. So regardless of if you regularly drink coffee or not, if you consume coffee, it's gonna increase the activity of your sympathetic nervous system. And another interesting finding is the group that did not regularly drink coffee, even when they drank the decaf espresso, their sympathetic nervous system activity still went up. Now that part's pretty interesting, right? The study thinks that there's other things in the coffee that also contribute to your sympathetic nervous system being activated, and that could entirely be true. But one thing to note is that your decaf coffee still has a little bit of caffeine in it. Decaf basically means it's a lower amount of caffeine, but you still get about a 30% amount of caffeine compared to a normal cup of coffee. So for someone who regularly does not drink coffee, even if they drink a decaf cup, it's still gonna affect them. And this is the problem now, where a lot of people right now have this chronically active sympathetic nervous system. And one of the reasons is a lot of people are in the state of chronic stress. Now, if you compare back to our ancestors, our ancestors did have times of stress, right? And I'm not just talking about when they had to fight off different predators or go hunting. I'm sure they experienced different types of stress like we do now, where if they lost a loved one or they went out to go hunt for food and they never came back, but the levels of our sympathetic nervous system were never meant to be chronically activated. And if you fast forward to now, when people are chronically stressed with work, and then they're stressed because they're in traffic when they come home, and then they're stressed because something happened at home, and they can never go into that relaxation mode. A lot of people, when you ask them if they're stressed out, they'll say, when am I ever not stressed? I know I've heard that from a lot of people as well, and at times I felt like that as well. But this is part of the problem. Now when you add caffeine or coffee into the picture, it's just gonna make this even worse because we've seen that coffee increases your sympathetic nervous system and it has a very high half-life. So it takes a really long time for this to get out of your system. So not only is your coffee blocking that adenosine molecule that I was talking about and preventing that sleep pressure from you going to sleep, it's also increasing your sympathetic nervous system and making it even harder for you to go to sleep. And just to further show this, every study that's been done on the impact of deficient sleep on the human body has shown an overactive sympathetic nervous system. When researchers are looking at their sleep participants and they're tracking their sympathetic nervous system and they track periods of their deficient sleep or basically where they're not sleeping good, they see that for that entire period and a little bit before and a little bit after, they're in a period of fight or flight or they're in a period of where their sympathetic nervous system is activated. Now again, if you add into the mixture where people are drinking caffeine and they're chronically stressed with work and other things going on in their life, then this period of fight or flight, it's not just gonna be a temporary thing. It can last for years. And the problem is that now you're adding insufficient sleep into the mixture. Because of all this type of stress and the caffeine that it's causing, now when you're adding insufficient sleep, that's gonna activate your sympathetic nervous system even more. Basically turning that sympathetic nervous system into overdrive. And what we see over time is this constant stress and this lack of getting good sleep will start to affect your body in a lot of other ways and start to cause a lot of other health issues. Now you might be wondering like, how much can I really improve if I cut out caffeine and I start improving my sleep? Like what can really happen? Well, here's a study just to show the power of improving your sleep and what it can do to even your physical performance. So this study was done on basketball players on the men's varsity team in Stanford. And what they did is they measured their performance after a few weeks of being at their baseline sleep level, basically sleeping like they normally would. And then they started encouraging them to sleep 
10 hours a night. I know that seems like a lot, but they were sleeping 10 hours a night and they were not consuming any alcohol, any caffeine, not having any naps, basically not doing anything that would disrupt their sleep. And what they found is those weeks where they started improving their sleep, their physical performance in their basketball games started getting a lot better. Their shot accuracy improved a whopping 9% and their sprint times also got significantly faster. So just by improving their sleep, they were able to run faster and shoot the basketball better. And this doesn't mean that you have to be an athlete or someone really special to benefit from your sleep. Anybody can benefit from improving their amount of sleep and their sleep quality. Now going back to caffeine, I think a big problem is how it's affecting a lot of kids and a lot of adolescents who are drinking caffeine regularly at such an early age. Caffeine is the only addictive substance that we regularly give to our teens and our kids. Now just to be blunt, I don't think any child needs to have caffeine. Studies are showing that 83.2% of teens are regularly consuming caffeine and about 96% are consuming caffeine occasionally. Now why is it that so many teens and kids need to have caffeine? Well, I think one of the biggest reasons is there's a change in our circadian rhythms as we age. Now again, our circadian rhythm is basically our body's sleep-wake cycle. It's a cycle of what tells our body to wake up and go to sleep, and it's done by a hormone called melatonin. So our melatonin will increase in concentrations throughout the day. So it will be at its lowest concentration when we wake up in the morning, and that's basically our signal to wake up. When we don't have any melatonin, that's our body's signal to wake up. And then throughout the day, specifically in response to darkness, our melatonin will start to increase and it'll peak at nighttime when it is dark. Now, everybody's circadian rhythm is a little different and it'll actually change as we age. So as a kid, we're going to have an earlier circadian rhythm. So we're going to want to go to sleep and wake up earlier. But then as an adolescent, as a teenager, it'll start to shift drastically forward. And it can actually shift about two to three hours forward. That's why so many teenagers like to sleep in and go to sleep later. But the problem is with the early start times, sometimes even starting at 7 a.m., a lot of these kids have to wake up super early and they have to cut out a lot of their sleep. And this can have a lot of detrimental effects on their body, on their brain, and a lot of effects on their ability to concentrate. Sometimes these kids have to wake up as early as 5 a.m. to get on the school bus so that they can get to their school in time. Now, school start times weren't always this early. If you go back 100 years ago, start times used to be at around 9 a.m. Now, at that time, 95% of kids could get up without using an alarm clock. Now, compared to now, pretty much everyone needs to have that alarm clock so that they wake up. But again, what that's doing is it's depriving you of those last couple hours of important sleep that you need so that you can function normally the next day. So again, going back to caffeine, this is why so many teenagers need to drink caffeine because they're not getting enough of that sleep opportunity at nighttime. Instead of getting the opportunity of eight to nine hours like you should be getting, they're getting two hours or three hours less than that. So they have to start self-medicating themselves with caffeine just to keep themselves awake. But the thing is that no matter what, there's only so much you can do to make up for some sleep deprivation. And anything, whether you're talking about a power nap or a caffeine, is only going to be a temporary fix. Because when you start getting sleep deprived, your body starts going into this sleep debt. And the reason it does that is, again, from this molecule called adenosine. The longer you're awake, the more this adenosine molecule will build up and the more that it will cause sleepiness. And if you don't get enough sleep, the adenosine molecule is still going to be hanging around. It's not going to be all cleared away. So when your adenosine molecules are constantly there, you're going to be in this state of constant brain fog. And this is why so many people, again, need to be drinking that caffeine to try to get out of that state and be in a more concentrative state. But this is the problem where people are drinking so much caffeine throughout the day and it starts to worsen their sleep. So now imagine a teenager who has to try to go to sleep in the evening, but they're drinking coffee all day and they have their last cup of coffee at around 3 p.m. Well, half of that cup of coffee is still gonna be in their system at 9 p.m. Because again, coffee has a really long half-life. So only half of that's being cleared away when it's time for them to go to sleep. And even a half a cup of coffee, even a small dose of caffeine, can really disrupt your sleep. It can mimic symptoms of insomnia and make it harder for these teenagers to go to sleep. And it can also make it harder for them to stay asleep throughout the night. And again, caffeine will also disrupt that NREM part of your deep sleep. And this deep NREM sleep is especially important 
for teenagers. It's important for everybody. But when people are developing and they're becoming more and more mature, this is when your NREM sleep gets super important. So there was an animal study where they administered caffeine to these juvenile rats and they found that it really disrupted their NREM sleep. And also these rats didn't develop as independent and they weren't able to explore the environment as a normal rat was. And the reason is when you're an adolescent or a teenager, this is a very crucial time for your brain to start maturing because there is a massive amount of reorganization happening in your brain during this time. And if you look at many of the major psychiatric disorders, these are things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, and ADHD. And these disorders commonly emerge when people are either children or adolescents. So there were a lot of studies done that were actually showing this. So there were studies done on teenagers and adolescents where they were getting these brain scans every couple of months to track their neural development. A proportion of these individuals, later on in life, they developed schizophrenia. And when they looked back and looked at the brain scans and the differences between normal people and people who developed schizophrenia, they found that there was a major difference in the patterns of brain maturation that was occurring during NREM sleep. And this, again, is that stage of sleep that gets affected when people have caffeine in their system. So there's other studies showing that children and teenagers who have a higher risk of developing schizophrenia and also adults who already have schizophrenia, they all have a lower amount of deep NREM sleep compared to a normal person. And specifically, there's about a two to three times reduction in the amount of NREM sleep that they're getting. So you can see that caffeine isn't just this innocent thing that we're giving to our children and our teenagers to help them get through school. It can have some serious long-term effects and effects that will affect them for the rest of their life. So if you're a teenager or if you're a parent, you wanna think twice about how often your child is consuming this caffeine. And what other studies have shown is, yes, caffeine can work to help with someone who is sleep deprived. So I'm not telling you to never drink caffeine. If someone is struggling with their concentration and they didn't sleep that well the night before, caffeine can help. But it's only a temporary fix. And this is where there is a common myth, where if you have long-term sleep deprivation, that you can get by on drinking caffeine every single day. And people can get into this never-ending cycle where they start drinking caffeine every single day and basically gets turned into this addiction where if you don't drink this caffeine, then you cannot function normally. Well, the root cause is you're not sleeping good and you're not getting enough of that quality sleep. You're not getting enough of that sleep quantity. Now, I don't have all the answers because, again, with these early start times, it's really hard for people to get enough and adequate sleep. So I'm more of an advocate of pushing school start times to later, to pushing them later to 9 a.m. again. Well, I know one thing people are gonna say is, well, that means that they're gonna get out of school an hour later. Well, I really don't see the big deal. If you can prevent a lot of psychiatric disorders, if you can prevent people from getting bad sleep and start improving people's sleep quality and prevent them from needing caffeine, then those benefits are really gonna outweigh the risks of changing these times a little bit. And I think there needs to be a major reform in schools and the education system. Now, melatonin is released throughout the day, and it's released more so in response to darkness, or in other words, absence of light. And melatonin will peak in the evening time or close to when it's time for you to go to sleep. This is also why some people take melatonin pills to help them go to sleep. Now, the thing to understand with melatonin is it doesn't actually 